um, turn with me in your Bibles, if you've got a Bible, uh, to Genesis chapter 21. If you don't have a Bible, then follow along with a friend or just listen along. Um, Genesis chapter 21. <clears throat> you know, life is full of both incredible positive memories, like the ones that uh, Becky and Danny just shared with us, but it's also full of more challenging times. <clears throat> And the communion is a time where we can remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We can remember what he went through and what his God, God his Father went through. And we can both celebrate his resurrection and we can also uh, understand that God is close to us when we mourn, when we have difficult times. And we're going to look at a, <clears throat> perhaps a slightly unusual passage for a communion talk today here in Genesis 21. We're going to talk about... Hagar and Ishmael. And Hagar was an Egyptian slave um, in Abraham's household. And just with that, we can begin to imagine that she had a pretty tough life. You know, we don't know anything about her, the beginning of her life, but she was brought up in Egypt. And somehow, at some point in her life, she was sold into slavery and uh, became a slave in the household of Abraham. And that must have been a pretty tough existence. And then later on in her life, her master, her mistress, uh, Sarah, uh, decided that since she, wasn't, she didn't think able to have children, she would invite Abraham to have Hagar, her slave girl, as a second wife, uh, which is alien to our culture. I don't recommend more than one <laughs> wife. One wife is a good number. <clears throat> um, but in that culture, it was not that unusual for, uh, um, uh, for, the, for that to happen in the household. And so she was elevated out of slavery to become the wife of uh, Abraham. And she must have thought, okay, at last, after my suffering, after the tough times in my life, you know, things are looking up for me. And then God blessed her with, uh, and she became pregnant, and she had a son uh, Ishmael, and she celebrated with her husband, and you know, the, many of us here are families, and we know the joy of having a child, and in that culture especially, to have a son was a, a very positive thing, and she must have felt like, okay, everything at last is going well for me. But uh, the first wife, uh, Sarah, was jealous of uh, the newfound success of her slave girl, and resented that, and um, and in the previous passage, back in chapter 16, we're not, we're not going to read to, uh, today, but uh, Sarah is jealous and ends up uh, arranging for Hagar to be sent away. And uh, then God has mercy on her and brings her back, and she says, you are the God who hears me. She names God. You are the God who hears me. And then life goes on, and then unexpectedly, uh, to, to Abraham and Sarah, uh, she gets pregnant late in life and has a baby. And uh, then she, Sarah you know, despises Hagar even more now that she doesn't need, in her mind, doesn't need her anymore. And uh, so when, when uh, the new son Isaac is weaned, um, <clears throat> Sarah tells Abraham that she should again send Hagar away with her son. And Abraham, distressed though he is, because this concerns his son, in chapter 21, verse 14, it says, Early in the morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water, gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. Grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. We'll stop there. 
Now, so Hagar got to a point of complete desperation in her life. She's wandering in the desert, and as you can imagine in the desert, if you don't have water, then life is not possible. And she reaches a point where she thinks, okay, we're going to die. I can't bear to watch my son die. And so she leaves him under a bush and retires to a short distance. Now, perhaps you've had a point in your life when you felt that desperate, and when you wondered whether there's anyone who understands your desperation. Maybe it's a relationship problem, maybe it's a financial problem, maybe it's a family problem. You know, we all have points in our lives where we feel desperate and we wonder, is there anybody who understands my pain? And the loss of a child is a particularly powerful uh, pain that Hagar is feeling at this point. And even though she had previously said, God is the God who hears me, right now, at this moment, she feels separated from God. She feels like no one's hearing him. And God sends her a messenger and said, you know, I have heard you. I have heard the crying of your son. And, she, and he opens her eyes so that she can see the well of water. You know, and that's what God wants us, the kind of relationship God wants to have with us, is when we don't feel heard, when we don't feel understood, when we feel like nothing is going well in our lives, that he still hears us, and then he wants to open our eyes to help us understand there are wells of water, wells of living water. How is this relevant to the cross? Well, on the cross, God himself was losing his son. You know, he cries out, you know, through the mouth of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, as Jesus dies, the curtain of the temple is torn in two, the earth, the earth is shook, you know, there is a, a, the whole earth cries out in the pain of God, you know, losing his son. And God wants us to understand, you know, the pain he's willing to go through in order that our deepest needs can be met not through the loss of a child or the loss of, you know, finances, relationships, but he wants to meet our deepest needs for a relationship with him and the forgiveness of the sins that we have committed against each other and against him. And the communion is a time where we can take bread that reminds us of Jesus' body broken on the cross. We can take fruit of the vine that reminds us of the blood poured out for us. And we can remember that God is the God who hears us. He hears us in our great celebrations and he hears us in our times of greatest distress when we feel like nobody else has heard us. And this is an opportunity for us as uh, a Christian body, as the Watford and Northwest London family of churches together to remember Jesus and the fact that he is the son of the God who hears us. Let's pray together. Dear Father God, thank you so much for being the God who hears us. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate with you. Thank you, God, that we can mourn with you. Thank you, God, that even in the mundane aspects of our life, you are here us, you hear, you are with us, and you hear us, and you want to uh, be close to us, to bind up the brokenhearted, to rejoice with us in our times of rejoicing. And we thank you, God, that you can open our eyes, Father Lord, when we're focused on ourselves, God, and then you can help us to find refreshment and a communion with you. Thank you that we can have communion with one another right now we can take this bread, this fruit of the vine, and connect with each other and with you through what your son did for us on the cross. Amen. Amen.